social media, and we're trying to get better at it. We have an awesome website. We're actually converting to a new website platform to make it even better and more user friendly. Um, we have a Facebook page that gets regular, gets not maybe every week, but it gets pretty regularly uh, updated and posted on. Um, that's how we get the word out about who's speaking, and maybe that's how some of you found out about what was uh, going on tonight. Um, yeah, so if you could just go to YouTube and then type in Earth and Construction Initiative and then subscribe, you'll get the alerts. The only thing we've put up there so far are these monthly uh, presentations. Construction? Earth and Construction Initiative on YouTube, and that should take, a, take you to our channel. And it's not like you're going to get something every day. It's the only thing we've been putting up there so far are these monthly presentations. So it's, it's quality information as well, guys. So where's the subscribe button? Right there. Really? Really? I just did it. <laughs> I did it too. And, and I'm just going to pass this around um, just to make sure everybody at the table got it there. If you signed up, that's the option. And then um, if you want to get on our email list, you can, if you're not already on it, you can make sure legibly write your email out. Or earth in it. So. Um, it's also a good idea to make another account and subscribe again. Oh, earth in here. Make another Google account. Oh. oh, okay. Okay, that's a good trick. Thank you, James. <laughs> um, and, uh, and everything's good to go for the recording. Okay, okay. sweet. So we're already on. Um, Thank you. Sure. So, actually, um, before we introduce tonight's speaker, uh, next month uh, will be. We do this every month. This is actually the fifteenth uh, month in a row where we've had this speaker series going, so it's pretty awesome so far. Um, next month we're going to have Tim White, one of our members, speaking, and his topic is going to be cement, mortar, stucco incompatibility uh, with earthen walls and traditional lime masonry and traditional limestone blocks. So he's going to be talking about how cement, mortar, stucco doesn't necessarily go with those materials and what that means in his practice. Um, and then I just want to mention who's... Uh, we mentioned who spoke last month because it kind of ties into tonight's speaker. Uh, last month it was Michael Donahue and his topic was Solum e Santo. Solum e Sano, he uh, titled it in Latin. Um, it was a cautionary tale of soil and health. And so he frightened us um, <laughs> very much uh, with uh, all the scary tales of microbes that can get into your body. Um, from playing in the dirt, uh, from over, and now it's not just from one time going out necessarily, but from consistent exposure to earth and materials, and it's not something that has been studied a ton. Um, the microbes, I think, are known to doctors and that kind of thing, but, you know, what kind of health effects are there on people who do earth and construction or who um, live in countries and have earth and floors, um, you know, predominantly, and that kind of thing. So. Um, it's not necessarily a big deal yet because we haven't, we don't have enough of the earth and construction going on to worry too much about the health effects. So he's kind of on the cutting edge of that. But every, he had everybody shivering and he had a few people asking, "But well, wait a second, I thought it was healthy to have microbes in your soil." And I said, "Well, it is actually." And we're going to have someone tell you about that <laughs> next month. And so um, Michael's not here tonight, but that's also why this is awesome that we get these recorded because then he's going to get to watch. Um, so or, when you're building with earth and construction, you generally don't want any organics in the soil. You want to remove the organic layer, set it to the side, which is actually really cool because then you can put it back, you know, hopefully. And um, but just below uh, or just above what we want to build with is this whole world of organics. And actually, that's what our speaker tonight, Tony Chung, is going to be talking about in his presentation, Farming for Microbes, Techniques for Soil re uh, Regeneration. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our speaker. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Chung. I'd just like to point out this picture to you. This is one of my favorite pictures on my farm. Uh, these are roots of a random plant. And these little white hyphae are actually fungal hypha that's actually proliferating through the soil and through this organic matter. And it's in a symbiotic relationship where it feeds this root structure and feeds the plants. And I caught it on my farm. It's just such a nice picture that I really like it. <laughs> Did you wash your hands afterward? No. Mad <laughs> <laughs> gloves, mad <Night> gloves. Oh. <laughs> Can we go to the next picture, or the next slide? Yes. Well, before I start, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to the UCI and thank you to all members here for giving me the opportunity to speak on something that I feel very passionate about. 
I, I appreciate all of you for taking the time out to come and see me speak, and, and yeah, it means a lot. Um, okay. So, I am, just to introduce myself, my, I'm Tony, I'm, I'm blessed to be owner and operator of Gopher Springs, we're a small organic farm that specializes in um, uh, one to one farming. It's a system where we grow food and everything within the same plot, same bed plot. Uh, we're three years old and our tagline is no pesticides, no herbicides, no fertilizers. I'm hoping to one day be able to grow food with no additional inputs whatsoever. Everything I grow will be on the same bed. Um, so what really, I wanted to share with you guys what really sparked my um, endeavors. Um, what really changed the way I approached gardening. Can we go to the next slide? Um, this is the question that I read maybe two or three years ago that kind of just shook me. Uh, I want you guys to just think about this. Don't, don't say it out loud, don't, don't influence anyone else's thoughts, but what percentage of a plant's biomass really comes from the ground? Just take a moment and imagine. Okay, next one. So imagine if you had something like this. This is a uh, beggar's lice. Um, it's not a mature beggar's lice. It doesn't have any seed pods on it. But look at this taproot. That thing is at least two feet into the ground. And I, I just basically pulled it right out of my soil. Um, this root is digging so far into the ground, you're imagining that it's pulling in all these nutrients, and all these minerals, and all this stuff. But I want you to just imagine if we took this plant chopped it up, threw it in the computer, ran some science on it, what percentage of that plant's biomass is actually from the soil itself? Just, just picture it. Can we jump to the next slide? The answer is 5%. 95% of that plant comes from the atmosphere. The bulk of that nutrient comes from the carbon and the CO2, the hydrogen from water, and nitrogen, which is also from the atmosphere, which gets fixated by nitrogen-fixing bacteria and then into nitrates. So forth. But the bulk of the plant really comes from the air. So what that means is, with plant nutrients, um, since it all originates from the, from the air, whatever you're growing, whether it's weeds or grass or trees or shrubs, it's all biomass. So long as you let it sit there, it would actually build your soil. And um, so when we really ask, what is it actually taking from the soil? Um, can we go to the next slide? For a plant nutrient, or for a plant to actually grow, it has to pull in macronutrients and micronutrients, which is a CO2, a carbon source, H2O, a hydrogen source, and nitrogen gas, which is a nitrogen source. The micronutrients are the stuff that it pulls from the soil, which are very trace, trace minerals. It's the same trace minerals that you need for your cells and your bodies to grow. Very small, minute amounts. So this is a this list basically tells you about all the uh, minerals that are found within the soil globally. This is a global average, meaning mm -hmm. whether it's the Sahara, whether it's a rainforest in Washington, whether it's you know someplace in Oregon, whether it's Texas. This is the average mineral concentration per milligram per kilogram of soil found within any soil in, in the world. And Right now, these numbers don't mean anything. Like, it's just a big list of numbers. Who, who knows what this means, right? But let's say we pick something like nitrogen. There's 2,000 milligrams of nitrogen in one kilogram of soil. So anywhere you go, there's that much nitrogen in the soil. How much does a plant really need of that amount to, to thrive? And the answer is just four. So there is more than enough nutrients. Mm -hmm. Can we go to the next one? There is more than enough nutrients within the soil to grow any plant that you need any plant whatsoever in any, more, any part of the world. The problem is, um, so the question is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's what> <laughs> <doing that. Okay. laughs> so the question is, why aren't my plants doing well? If you have all the nutrients that you need for the plants to grow, then what's wrong? What, what's, what's stopping them from growing? Well, the reason is, the plants, um, the nutrients that are in the soil are in a non- I'm sorry. The nutrients in the soil aren't in a plant available form. Mm -hmm. It's in such a it's in your sand, your silt, your clay, your rocks, your pebbles, your boulders. It's in this ionic bond that the plants cannot break down and spread and use. So, can we go to the next one? Oh. 
That's just pretty much repeating what I said. <laughs> One more. <laughs> so, what a plant needs in order to actually make use of this um, reservoir of supplies is the soil food web. These plants secrete organic matter through the form of exudates, which then feed up the bacteria and fungi, which goes and produces organic acids, which dissolves these salt, this, um, I'm sorry, these silt, the sand, the clays, and to minerals that these fungi and bacteria can use. And then comes along the protozoa and the nematodes, which eat the bacteria and fungi. And then in their waste stream, the plants take up the plant bill for nutrients. So the plant life actually depends on this soil food web, or the microbes in the system. So in a sense, um, the plants need to have the bacteria and fungi on their roots. So to keep them there, what they end up doing is uh, producing something called plant exudates, which is basically carbs and sugars that they ex exude into the soil. They're basically feeding the soil, and the bacteria and the fungi thrive off of that. And in a symbiotic relationship, these bacteria um, multiply rapidly, which then leads to the protozoa and nematodes coming in to feed off of them. I always thought that was a fascinating subject because when you really look at it, what plants are doing is farming microbes. They're farming something that feeds them in the, in the long term. And it's very similar to how we grow and how we live. We farm things in order to, for us to eat and survive. And it just, it was fascinating to me. Go to the next slide. This is an example of what I'm talking about. This is a pea plant that I pulled up. Uh, all these root hairs is basically from the plant itself. It goes in about maybe three or four inches into the soil. And you can see these little clusters. These are nitrogen-fixing nodules. Uh, these are bacterial clusters that form on the pea, pea roots. And if you look closely, you can see this little white fuzz. And throughout the root hairs, those are mycorrhizal hyphae that actually form a symbiotic relationship with everything else. With everything else. Can I go to the next one? I took this slide from uh, David C. Johnson just because it, it illustrates so well what, what I'm trying to describe. This plant right here has these deep orange yellow roots and all these little hyphae strands for the mycorrhizal network. This mycorrhizal network actually goes out into the soil, hunts for food, and then brings it back and exchanges it in some sort of symbiotic relationship with the plant in order to feed itself and feed, feed the plant as well. And I just thought it was such a neat picture. When you really look at it, if this is just the root structure, everything else is mycorrhizal. So, how do we grow food? And, and by we, I mean how do I grow food? <laughs> <laughs> um, I go through a system where we do no-till, because tilling actually ruins that mycorrhizal network. It takes a long time for, for fungus to grow out and branch like Bacteria, you can put a bacteria in you know, a petri dish and that thing will take off within two hours it will multiply, multiply, multiply. Mm -hmm. And in ten hours you go from one bacteria to millions of bacteria. Just because they grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. With fungus though, it grows from a, a single point and it branches off real slow. And every time you till or any time you damage that structure, it takes a long time for that microbe network to form itself back up again. So some of the things that I've been working on with my farm is uh, using straw or glass, grass clippings to mulch. This picture doesn't really do it justice, but what I ended up doing here was, you can see how my original land was like. Now, there is a bed here, a walkway, and a bed here. And all I ended up doing was mowing and shredding up grass and using that to suppress all these weeds. That layer of mulch is maybe about four to five inches thick and nothing grows through that. Like hardly anything. Bermuda might have a chance, but when you pile on like this and add on cover crops or any other plants, it usually tends to shade everything out, which works pretty well. Uh, you can see a little random, thing. I think this is a watermelon that came up as a volunteer, <laughs> and we had watermelon. <laughs> Next one. One of the things I wanted to point out to you guys is uh, with nature, nature doesn't dig anything into the soil and plant seeds into the ground. Nature basically has seeds flying from the air and it lands in between the clusters of grass and those take root and seed and spread. 
And you can see how well this lettuce mix is doing, just because I, I spilled this lettuce on the ground, in between the grass, and you can see it thriving. And the reason why this is possible is because um, the mycorrhizal network that these plants, the lettuce use, is similar to the same, or similar or the same as the ones that the grass uses. They, they share a basic family, and the only reason why they compete with each other is because there's not, available, there's not enough available nutrients in the soil. But we proved that earlier, that there's plenty of nutrients in the soil, mm -hmm. plenty for all plants to exist. The problem is the soil food web is not strong enough or healthy enough to supply everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have competition. But if you can actually get your soil to be really healthy, this is possible. You can grow food in this entire cluster and harvest anything you want and not have a problem whatsoever. And just imagine how easy it is to seed like this. You just go out there, or, or what I would do is, I go out there and I either shred or I mow as low as I can, come back in there, spread some seeds on the ground, water it in, maybe mulch it, and then walk away. And then it just grows by itself. Now this living organic matter basically cools the soil. And not only that, since you have a living root in the ground, all those microbial networks are still available. They're still there. So these plants, once they start rooting out, they get established in the same network, and they start using the same supplies that these guys use. Next one. This is some of uh, the ways I prep my beds. I have a spot where it just grows these random weeds that pop up. So I know those weeds do well in this soil, and I just go out there and I chop and drop, and I mow and I lay it down as mulch. And that smothers all the grass. And once that's established, I just go in there and I transplant right into that mulch. Mm -hmm. And everything grows right through it. Mm -hmm. Can I next one? Some of the techniques I use is um, bird nesting. Uh, this is soil that has been smothered for about three months. So you can see nothing's growing through there. You can see the community, you can see all the other grasses coming through. And what I end up doing here is to, to get that inoculum of good microbes. I get really good compost and I put it in a small hole called bird's nest and I plant my seeds directly into that. And in that case, the, the roots of the plants start spreading out, but since there's nothing to compete with it, it just thrives and this whole place is covered. I think uh, last year we did chili peppers this way. Oh, one of the neat little things here is um, you can see this half dead cattle panel. It's bent into like a dome shape. Mm -hmm. And we wrap the... Uh, it's similar to plastic, but it's breathable. It's um, it's not landscaping cloth. It's a row cover. We wrap the row cover on it, and that just folds right over during the winter and protects my plants. Oh, so another thing that we do on the property is uh, we have swales. We basically figure out what the slope is on the land, and we cut a swale perpendicular to that slope in order to harvest passively rainwater or any other water or irrigation that comes onto the property. Um, there's been some talk about how this can lead to anaerobic pockets and and there I, I think it's divided on whether or not swales are good or bad for the environment or for your ecosystem. Uh, I've been having good luck with it just because I fill my swales up with leaf cut leaf cuttings, wood chips, and branches, and just random stuff like that. So the moisture actually helps to rot down the wood and Rot down all the biomass in the swales. So, next one. so this is an example of what I have on the property. This was maybe three years ago when we planted some peach trees. Uh, the contour is like this, so it's going the, it's going downhill towards the, the screen here. And these beds are about eight feet apart or eight feet wide, and the swales are about six feet uphill. The idea is when it rains, all that water comes down the hill, fills up the swale, and then goes around. And that swale keeps a pocket of water, which ends up irrigating all the plants in that, on that swale. In this one. This is the same view, but from uphill of that swale. This is maybe about two years later. You can see how much life there is now, and how much water is kept in that swale. Um, sometimes there's more than water stays in that swale for longer than a week. And that's never, that's one of the drawbacks I see to having large swales like this. You run into problems with mosquitoes and like anaerobic conditions and this and that. But if you have it filled up with leaves and twigs and sticks, it nullifies a lot of that. I think there might be still some conditions with anaerobic pockets, but for the most part, I don't notice a problem. 
you can see uh, just everything growing within each other. Uh, I know it's hard to imagine and hard to see and hard to grasp just because you know it's not what we're used to. It's not used to the agricultural methods that we're used to. But everything thrives in this condition, and the soil gets better every year. So these are how I plant plant some of my beds. I uh, every fall, um, a lot of people in Austin basically rake up all their leaves and throw in these little brown bags. Mm -hmm. And I drive down the road and I see one and I toss it in the back of my truck. <laughs> and I take it home and it's all this carbon rich material that I just dump on these beds and I create beds and create beds. And you can see how I started with just a row of onions and this is smother cropping so that um, we can kill the Bermuda. That's basically just knocking out all the sunlight so nothing exists down there. And this is maybe about six inches of beef mulch. Same deal with these other beds down here. Next one. And this is what it looks like a few months in. You can see the onions coming up through all the, the hay and the mulch. This is a berm. Uh, we call this a beneficial berm. This is basically a sacrificial berm. I have like <laughs> plants that I don't really care about that I chop and drop and add to the soil so that it feeds the next generation of life. The idea with this is um, I have one berm and then three beds and then another berm. And I want to put in trees that, and beneficial insect insect attracting plants in order to... The idea is if I put a tree here that has birds in it, birds will nest in that tree and then come down and eat up all the bugs that are eating my plants. So you're building an ecosystem that basically protects your, your plants. It also serves as a windbreak just in case your, your plants get hit by like hailstorms or like, any gusts of winds or something like that. The next one. This is what it's like uh, maybe two weeks ago. The same onion beds here, these are all cover crops that I've added in those rows. With the cover crop, I'm going to wait until it goes to a little bit more brown, a little more seed, and then I can actually just go in there with a the hedge trimmer real low and just shred everything down to the ground. And the reason why I use a hedge trimmer instead of like a mower is because you have longer, longer pieces cut. And those longer pieces take longer to break down and actually add as mulch. If you actually use a lawn mower, you have these really, really fine small pieces that just decompose and then just smother and turn to mush. And you don't really want that. You want that loft. You want that air gap. And yet you still want that protection. So with this, I could just hedge trim, lay it in place, and transplant right into that. Or I could rake it back, throw in a bunch of seeds, and when it sprouts, rake it back on top again. And everything grows just easily. By using the hedge trimmer, though, I still leave all the roots in the ground. Most people would come out there and they till it all up, break down uh, all the structure, break down everything that you built. But by using the hedge trimmer, you still have the roots in the ground. The plants more than likely won't survive because you took off more than 90% of the biomass. So it's such a shock that they die. Mm -hmm. But the roots are still there. The roots are still alive. And they're still feeding the mycorrhizal and all the bacteria that's in the soil. So they continue to thrive. And when you put those seeds in, they take right over and then smother everything else out. Oh, can we go back one? One of the things I, I didn't point out to you was um, even the beds I have are on swales. If you notice the pathways in between the beds, they're on contour. The slope of the land is going this way. When it rains, all the water goes downhill into these swales, fills up, goes to the next swale, fills up, goes to the next swale, goes up, goes to the next swale. This basically is, minimizes my water usage drastically. And So keys to remember for a healthy soil, um, no bare soil. Mother Nature abhors barren soil. She always has something covering up the soil. Uh, you always want a living root in the ground because um, without the living root, even if you buy all the mycorrhiza, even if you buy all the microbes, even if you buy everything you need, you throw it all on the ground, without something feeding that mycorrhiza constantly, it's just going to die. Or it's going to go into the state where it needs to hibernate and there's no use for it. So you always have to have a living root, some sort of perennial root that feeds the soil. And mulch is your friend, especially in Texas. We get 120 degree days sometimes. You know, without that mulch, that soil dries so, so much. And yeah, and that, that's my talk, guys. <laughs> <laughs>
Please tell us how you learned all these things. Is this part of a larger system? It sounds like permaculture. It is a larger system. Um, I delved into permaculture luckily. I volunteered one time for um, something called the Permabrit and discovered permaculture before then. Uh, before I went down that route, I wanted to do monoculture dragon fruit. If you guys have ever seen dragon fruit mm -hmm. in stores, yeah. I really thought I could do it here. <laughs> but apparently it's just a little too cold. Um, the bigger picture is permaculture, uh, but the way I look at it, it's more like regenerative agriculture. Yeah. yeah. And the idea and that is, you're regenerating the soil. Mm -hmm. right. The idea is everything I'm doing, even though I'm taking nutrients out of the soil, let's say, let's say you have a bed and you're growing corn. Now, that corn is using up nitrates, it's using up nutrients, it's using up this and that. When you harvest that corn and you take it away, you're actually taking away nutrients from the soil. Now, we know there's more than enough nutrients for that plant to continue on living, but with this system, by returning all your, your produce and by returning all that plant waste and leaving it in the ground, it's actually feeding the soil. So no matter, every time I grow a crop, my soil gets better. So every time I harvest something, the soil gets better and better and better. And that's the purpose of, of this. Any other questions? So you get mulch from anywhere? Like anything? You can get mulch from anywhere. Some of your plants might have allopathic um, effects, stuff like uh, oaks and, and acorns. So there's some things that you don't want to use, but the majority of uh, plants use endo, endomycorrhizal bacteria. Some like 95% of plants use endomycorrhizal bacteria. So that means that anything you use is basically fair game for your plants. Mm -hmm. You talked about, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning. Um, you talked about the planting into compost. Mm -hmm. And are there some things that would be a little too sensitive to that, the compost, or if it's well I try to use a, cured, it's okay for anything? Or? I try to use a vermal compost, stuff that's been already processed and ready to use. If you start your seeds inside that, it's, it's pretty much good to go. Mm -hmm. Adding compost directly into the soil might be a little harsh. Uh, I wouldn't use it fully. Um, when I start to my seeds, I basically go to my soils and I pick up um, leaf litter that's in the side of the soils mm -hmm. that's broken down for like a year now. And 90% of my plugs or 90% of my seed starts is leaf litter. And then I sprinkle on top maybe 10% of vermicompost. And in that, I put my seeds. So the vermicompost has your inoculum of microbes, and it's good to go. And that inoculum basically infects the rest of the leaf litter and creates the environment that you need for your plants. And I is the vermicompost, is that worms? Worm compost. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Worms. <laughs> so do you have a place on your land where you do the worm compost? I have a above ground vermicomposting box. Okay. It's basically a four foot by two foot box that I throw all my clippings, all my waste in, all my kitchen waste, and I have some red wigglers in there. Right. At the moment, I'm just buying vermal compost because I use so little of it. Like you're you're sprinkling just a little bit on top of all your seed trays. So, for the most part, once that's established, I'll, I'll gather my own. But right now, I'm buying that. <laughs> Do you have a good source for it that you want to tell us about? Um, organics by Gosh. Uh -huh. is, one. is that in Austin? That's in like Elgin. -ish. Where? Elgin. Okay. But you can basically buy that anywhere. Yeah. Online or in Texas or any of the nurseries. Mm -hmm. You can buy the ones. Mm -hmm. You can buy the ones too. I missed like $29. Like a pound. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, they're called California the red colors. They're not, big. Not quite earthworms. They're like a little smaller than earthworms, bright red. Mm -hmm. they, they just tend to be the ones that people use because they're easy to maintain. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the, this one is bigger, but it's still. Mm -hmm. You can use night crawlers if you yeah. use earthworms. It's just they're hard to keep around. So with all the uh, the care you take to preserve the mycorrhizal network, and when you're when you're doing the smothering and messing or mulching and smothering or even the solarizing it that way, is there a limit to the amount of time that the soil can sit that way and that network remain viable? Um, so long as you keep it moist, I think it's gonna grow. It's not as healthy as if you actually had living ground cover. 
The smothering is one of the first things I did here because I thought, oh, it's not good to have these weeds growing next to everything. But once I discovered that, you know, they can grow healthily side by side, I kind of got away from actually smothering. It just helps a lot for harvesting because now you have basically a monoculture or something that doesn't have grass in it while you're harvesting. Yeah. So in a sense, it, it kind of helps, but at the same time, it kind of harms what you're doing. Uh, how is this system that you were describing here, how is it affecting the trees in the area? You said you had some peach trees and some other trees mm -hmm. in that system. How are they reacting? For the most part, I don't really notice them doing much. Like, they seem to be growing just as well, just as fine. Um, I don't really have like a comparison that I could you know, make, just because all I have is all my trees are on swales. If I actually had one that was off the swell, I could say, like, oh, okay, I see this, I see that. Uh, when I do notice that when my plants or when everything is growing in, like these cover crops are growing in, the soil tends to be more friable or more loose. I can actually sink my hands into there. When I actually have it just covered in mulch or covered in wood chips or anything like that, the soil tends to dry out and get a little tougher. Like, you can't actually sink your hands in as well. And you, you just notice, like you notice right away. With these little roots that come into the ground, whenever it rains, the rain just kind of follows the trail of the roots and sink deeper into the soil. Without roots, so it's basically sitting on top of the soil and then trying to slowly permeate in. But there's no openings, there's no nothing to go off of, so it just runs off. Yeah. So like for construction projects, you often have clear site, mm -hmm. remove the topsoil, throw it in a pile somewhere or whatever. <laughs> no, yeah. We're not always very careful with it. Um, and then we put it back and then it doesn't grow all the stuff that it used to. Yeah. Or stuff that people want. But would you, uh, are there any suggestions from this kind of regenerative agriculture that you do to keep that soil better or to uh, help it along its way to grow so that you don't just have to put grass and pesticides on it? Once you till or do massive construction where you're moving or you're breaking down those networks, if you can actually seed right into it, right then and there, and keep a living root structure in the ground, those mycorrhizal populations will still continue to grow. What's going on is when you when we till up all the soil, all those connections are broken, everything's scattered, everything starts to die. But all those mycorrhizas are looking for a root to basically glom onto and then start continuing to live. If you don't have any living, those root structures or those um, microbes basically go into hibernation mode. They go into like sporation and this and that to where they, they're not as effective for the plants anymore. And in, in your situation where you're removing the topsoil, setting it aside for a couple of days, and then putting it back, all those um, spores and stuff like that, microbes are still there in the hibernation state, and they take time to germinate again and then come back and then restore it. So then, if you had to move it for a, a extended period of time, so you have like a large commercial mm -hmm. urban project where you're moving a lot of top, so would it be possible that you could somehow create a, a, an approach where you actually lose some kind of cover on the stored top pile mm -hmm. to get to keep the, that that whole network active, and then and then consider that a sacrificial crop when you put it when you put it back. Then, um, thick layers of mulch, basically to help. Uh, keep the sun off the soil. Uh, UV kills anything. UV kills plastic, UV kills microbes, UV kills rust. <laughs> like, if you have protection from UV rays, it actually prevents the soil or prevents the microbes from dying as fast. Um, it also creates a human environment for them to thrive. So the, what, let's say we have this pile of dirt, we, we, we cover with mulch. All those mycorrhizal networks that we've broken are trying to figure out how to expand or how to grow. Now, since we till it up, it's has, it has more access to foods since it's touching more things now. But without the plant exudates, it's not going to thrive. So it still wants to travel and grow and spread, and it's going to take time. But the best thing we could do is create the best conditions for it, which is to mulch everything and keep it wet. Not wet, but humid. Mm -hmm. Moist. That's the word. What size is your farm? Uh, just shy of 12 acres. 12 acres. Mm -hmm. If you had the manpower, how big would you be able to grow? Just by myself, I realized one acre is a lot. 
<laughs> more angry, more than, more than capable of. But eventually I'd like to do the full 12. Uh, in permaculture, they teach us to break it into zones. Zone, zone one is basically where you spend the most amount of time. And that's where I want to spend, spend the majority of my days. When you go out to zone two, three, four, and five, you spend less and less time out there. So you have to plan out um, things that you do that require less time. Like maybe in zone five, I'll grow um, trees that for sale. Those things require less maintenance, less time, less, less effort. So they could be in the back of the property. But places where I need to grow vegetable crops and I have to come out every day, that's zone one, which is closer to the house. Yes? Have you ever experimented with adding mycelium to your soil for uh, increasing the, my uh, the mycorrhizum? Mycelium? Mm -hmm. uh, mushrooms? I have thrown mushrooms out there, and they do seem... I've had good results with mushroom compost. But it's it to say it's like, the mycorrhizums. Mm -hmm. It's a form of mycorrhiza. It's like a sarcophytic or something like that. Sarcophytic. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what the word was. But um, like 95% of plants use an endomycorrhizal um, fungus, fungus. So anything that you add to the soil will actually benefit because it will just increase diversity. And, uh, I've actually experimented with uh, using store-bought mushrooms, like uh, morels, like stuff that I finished cooking and I had like chunks left over. Instead of throwing it into my compost, and I have thrown it in my compost. But I've actually went out there, got some wood chips, crushed it up, and then buried it, buried it around my garden. And I have seen mushrooms pop up whenever it rains. Random mushrooms will pop up. So I do know that it's actually doing something for the soil, but conclusively I can't really say much. It roots down those acids mm -hmm. for it to feed off of easier. Mm -hmm. I think they do something, um, they release some sort of uh, organic acids. Um, one of the things I, I didn't address but we kind of glossed over was when we were talking about all the um, minerals that are in the soil being in a non-plant available form. The microbes actually secrete organic acids which digest those minerals some rocks, the sand, the soil, the clay, and those minerals are absorbed by those microbes, and that that is the only way your plant is actually able to make use of all those nutrients that are within the ground. And, and yeah, I think any sort of diversity that you add to your soil is actually pretty good for your soil. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one. Yes, um, aside from taking soil off the top and moving it someplace else. If you're talking about a construction site, you've got the ground that's close to the building site that's going to be trampled a lot. Mm -hmm. Should uh, is there any kind of mitigation you do to the part of the uh, earth that's going to be trampled and driven over and all that, or should that also be moved over and taken care of while construction is going on? It depends on what you plan to do with that site afterwards. Um, if you're hoping to actually have a lawn or grass. Uh, the problem is you have all this compaction, so roots are going to have a hard time coming into that ground or like breaking it apart to get in there or even have moisture infiltrate into that ground. Uh, I recommend <coughs> doing something like some sort of cover crop, like daikon radishes or some sort of long taproot things. And if you spread those around and mulch them, give them a chance to actually dig into the soil for you, they're basically serving the function of tilling. And once they break down and then rot and feed the soil, then you can come in with another crop that you want, like grasses or like any, anything really. But compaction is one of the biggest enemies to any garden. Like compaction, even if you have compacted dirt and you cover the mulch and spread it with seed, those seeds are going to have a hard time getting into the ground, even if it's perfect conditions. So if the seeds are having a hard time getting in, mycorrhizal can't get in, then the bacteria can grow, and then you just have basically like an inch worth of topsoil. Would you use the same process or something similar with, you know, a lot of urban yards or whatever, or people want, suddenly want to grow things, and maybe there have been dogs, or maybe there have been cars parked there, or maybe, you know, all sorts of things. And the people here often, you know, bring in, make a raised bed, mm -hmm. um, 
and bring in dirt and all of that, but that's several hundred dollars at the least to just get a couple of tomato plants going. Is there? <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm looking at this and thinking about what I've done over the last 15 years in my in my yard, which it was never as bad as what I was as some of my neighbors. But <laughs> my point being, how would you, you know, how would you get from that that yard in the city um, that maybe doesn't have real deep soil anyway, but has enough that that That's if it was like the repaired get them would be good soil? Um, how would you help sort of guide that process for folks so that they don't get discouraged about you know? Mm -hmm. I don't have a green thumb. So, so mm -hmm. any soil mm -hmm. is possible to grow anything, so long as the, my, the soil food web is there. Um, I'd recommend you, if you're missing the microbes, uh, Yeah, I think you would be in most of those cases, mm -hmm. wouldn't you? I mean, for they're, the most part, in there. They're everywhere. But if you want to jumpstart the microbes, what you could do is you can go down to a local park or somewhere where you see um, the conditions that you want. You can go underneath a tree and it looks like it's thriving there. You have all these uh, chickpeas and weeds and grass growing, so you know the soil is very lush. Now, as you spread the leaf litter apart and just take take like a chunk of mycorrhizal or leaf microbes, and you can take that and put it in your compost pile. Mm -hmm. Now you just basically inoculate your compost with all the microbes that you need that mm -hmm. looks like that soil. Mm -hmm. And then once that starts thriving, you take that compost and add to your soil as well. If you're looking to do raised beds and you know not buy dirt, um, leaves, leaves, mm -hmm. leaves all day long. Um, wood chips, wood chips really help. I think leaves are better. Right. There is something called a um, Johnson Sioux bioreactor, which is a no-turn uh, compost system, which is very fascinating. I highly recommend everyone look that up. Uh, the idea is you have this tower. It's basically you know, around, um, I think they use a construction mesh, the, the rusty kind of little four by four mesh. And they, they make this big tower and they soak all these leaves and twigs and sticks that they find in some water and they dump it in. And inside the tower there's these PVC pipes that go throughout the, the tower. And the idea is once, once you have that tower built up within 24 hours, you can pull those pipes out and it creates these little cavities which inside your mm -hmm. compost inside your compost. Mm -hmm. And those cavities allow air to travel into your compost. Mm -hmm. Air can travel about twelve inches within your compost pile before it, before it stops. Mm -hmm. So so long as your spacing is adequate, you never have to turn your compost. Wow. So wow. within nine months you have a very fungal dominant compost, which is actually That's good to know. Good so what was that called? Johnson Sioux Bioreactor. Johnson uh, Stu? Johnson Sue. Oh, S U. Johnson Sue. And then Johnson and his wife's name is Sue. Oh, okay. Well, I understand <laughs> Sue, but I was at home. I think okay. <laughs> That's cool. It's an interesting bioreactor. I haven't had much uh, work with that, but that's the one thing that I'm following right now that I, I'd like to try. Cool. Any other questions? Thanks, Tony. Okay, thank you. We can go and visit you over there? Yes, please. Ah, okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> you come. Really well, Thank thanks you. for the presentation. Uh, for those of you, if this is your first time and you haven't signed in yet, please sign in. Thank you. And also, um, come back next month. We'll put it on May 7th. Okay. Now we have a place where we have a take a picture of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let everyone see it. Did I hand you this as well? Stop. Yes. That's your wife? No. Oh, oh. And that's the one that I have. Do you think you're not doing it? Yeah. 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 Do you think you're not doing it? Yeah.